Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, uh, to CSIS. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program. And for today's purposes, I am the, uh, the, uh, the convener and director of the U.S. ASEAN Strategy Commission, which has, uh, has uh, done its work over the course of the last year. <clears throat> Uh, the commission is co-chaired by um, uh, Mr. Maurice Hank Greenberg and Secretary William Cohen, and uh, we have several representatives uh, of the commission here. Um, to uh, my immediate right, George David, uh, uh, Carla Hills, and on the far right, um, uh, Mr. Roderick Hills. So I'd like to, uh, to uh, thank all of them for their hard work and the other members of the commission. Over the course of the, pa of the past year, the commission has met four times. It has taken two major trips to Southeast Asia, met with the heads of state, uh, business leaders, uh, senior officials, civil society, the media. Uh, in the United States, we've convened meetings with um, all those groups and others. Uh, we work very closely with the administration um, and Congress, as well as with uh, um, uh, the ASEAN uh, ambassadors, to try to pull together a set of recommendations that would uh, provide um, uh, the pillars of a foundation, or the pillars that would make a foundation for a, a long-term American strategy for Southeast Asia. I think we're there. Uh, we have uh, recommendations that are uh, we're rolling out today, and um, the the chairman, the co-chairman, will uh, make a, a brief statement about our work, and uh, then I will um, open the floor uh, to uh, questions and observations from the other chairs, from the other uh, commissioners, and uh, they'll answer your questions uh, and take your comments. So, Mr. Greenberg, if I can, I'll hand it over uh, to you, please. Thanks, Ernie. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, as Ernie Bauer said, um, the, uh, the commission uh, made several trips to the ASEAN region and, and met with the leaders and business community and, and others. The U.S. has been engaged in, in the ASEAN region for many, many years. We're no strangers to the region. Uh, American business uh, has been in the region for many, for a long time and has built significant businesses and trade relations in the ASEAN countries. What has disturbed the, uh, us is that in recent years, there's been sort of a decline in American business activities in the region. And one of the purposes of, of this commission is to determine why that is so and what we can do to reestablish our presence in a bigger way, not that we have no presence now, we do and it's very significant, but what more can we do uh, to enhance that? And we've several, there are many recommendations, and I'll discuss them in a moment. Um, and uh, Secretary Cohn will discuss the military aspects uh, of that. The ASEANs want us in the region, there's no question about that. Every country that we have visited uh, is uh, wants us more engaged uh, in the region, not less so. And, uh, and, and we want to be more engaged in, in the region. There are a number of things that we should be doing. Uh, certainly we want to have more students, for example, uh, from the region visit and study in the United States. To do that, we have to get the visa issues under control so that it's easier to get a visa. We want to have a trade mission uh, to the ASEAN region. Um, that uh, uh, would go a long ways if it's led by the President of the United States or a very senior official. It would make a big difference. It would show our commitment from a bit from a, in the, to the ASEANs that we're serious about this. It would not be something that we just talk about but never follow up on and do. So that's critical that we do something like that. So there is a, a strong desire for us to grow more in the region. We have talked about for years a U.S. ASEAN tra free trade agreement. Uh, other countries have trade agreements with the ASEAN countries. We don't. We need a, a, an ASEAN free trade agreement. Now we recognize starting to, to try to get one done today would be impossible. 
But that doesn't mean we shouldn't start on that long journey to get one done. We should. It would be a nice signal also to the ASEANs that we're serious about increasing our trade relations with them. So these are some of the things that would be useful. It's no secret that, uh, that uh, other countries are doing more uh, with the ASEANs currently than we are. China is a very big trading partner uh, of the ASEANs. Uh, they have a free trade agreement. It's been in place now for about 12 years. So there is need for us to increase our presence, increase our business activities, increase the flow of students back and forth, in increase uh, visa opportunities that would bring more people to this country and us to them. So those are some of the things that would be very useful. Now I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Cohen. We'll talk some other aspects. Just a few words to add to uh, uh, Hank Greenberg, uh, who has been a real leader over the years, many years, uh, throughout the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I would say it's a almost a three R uh, proposal. Uh, to reestablish leadership in the ASEAN uh, area, countries, to reassure the ASEAN countries that we intend to remain in an Asian Pacific power uh, as such, and that we intend to re-engage them in a major way across the spectrum from trade, education, culture, and sports, among others. Uh, they are looking now at our domestic uh, situation, uh, wondering whether we have the uh, either the wallet or the will to coin um, President Bush 41. Uh, do we have the wallet or the will to remain engaged at a time when we know that China certainly is growing in both size and influence on the trade issue and eventually in the military issue as well? So what is the United States, what role do we see for ourselves and are we going to turn inward? Uh, are we going to pull back? Are we going to say, uh, let the, the Asia region take care of uh, the Asia? Uh, so this is something that's going on that we have to be uh, very forthright to deal with, to say, no, no. We've got commitments that were made by Secretary Bob Gates before he left. He uh, gave a very important speech in, uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, we have the same uh, message being carried by uh, uh, Secretary uh, Panetta. We have the same message by Secretary of State uh, uh, Clinton and President Obama, to be sure. So there is no difference in terms of what the policy objectives are. The question is, are we going to remain committed? This particular um, uh, group, this task force as such, uh, has put forth uh, some recommendations which we think are critical. Some of them are already being implemented by the administration. So we're, we're not pushing against, we're pushing against an open door at this particular point, but we want to go further. We want to be more aggressive about it. We want to do this in a way that is consistent with the interests of the ASEAN nations, to know that we're doing this uh, on a trade uh, basis, economic basis, uh, not to uh, in any way jeopardize their relationship with, uh, with China or to cause undue friction uh, with China, but to say that this is important for the region uh, for their security, for their economic security, and uh, for prosperity. Uh, so we intend to remain engaged in that sharing of that prosperity uh, by encouraging our own uh, companies to invest, by encouraging our own government to, uh, to uh, open up its uh, trade policies. And on the military side, uh, we stress uh, international military education programs, training programs, IMET. Uh, we want to have more exercises with uh, the ASEAN countries, military exercises on a bilateral and multilateral basis. We want to engage in more humanitarian type exercises because we know the value, what that means. When you can see our respective militaries cooperating to help bring relief to uh, areas that have been damaged by uh, natural causes, uh, by tsunamis or typhoons or any other type of uh, natural disaster, very important. Uh, that the military being usually the only institutions in any country uh, that has the training and the logistics and the capability of delivering humanitarian assistance in a time of need. So we need to do all of these things. And uh, this particular set of recommendations is a good first step. We hope there'll be more that will follow. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me invite uh, the other commissioners to, uh, to comment if they like at this time. 
I would only underscore what our two very able uh, co-chairs have said. One of the missions of this report is to heighten public awareness of how important the ASEAN region is. Fifteen years ago, Asia was not 50 percent of the global GDP. Today it is, and ASEAN is a very significant se uh, segment of Asia. ASEAN has trade agreements with uh, the three, uh, Japan, China, and Korea. We don't, save for our recent adoption of the Korean Free Trade Agreement. And so, relatively speaking, yes, our investment in ASEAN is uh, very, very substantial, larger than in our investment in China. But relatively speaking, we are losing our place in the world. That is, others are overtaking us. And with the significance of Asia, and with our need to create jobs and more opportunity, we want those <coughs> markets open to us. So we believe that a free trade agreement, if it has to be conducted with ASEAN <coughs> in stages, because of the different levels of development of the components of ASEAN, the ASEAN 10, so be it. We could start with three, four, five or six, keep, the, keep it open and keep going. But I think that the economic and military comments that have been made really summarize some of the things that ought to command the attention of both the American people and our elected representatives. Much of what we have done and what we hope you all will do is convince this world, our country, our people and our Congress that ASEAN is an important place, 600 million people. We were, the best we were the number one trading partner of ASEAN for a very long time. Now we're number four. We're losing a, a, a political position and we're losing a business position critical to our country. And they know that. They want us there, but they're not, they're not sure we're coming. And so part of what we've done is to say, as Secretary Cohen said, reestablish the leadership that we had for so many years in that part of the world. comments made previously by our co-chairs and other commissioners. Uh, several of us had the privilege 15 years ago of uh, being on a CEO trade mission to the ASEAN nations. The notable fact is that was 15 years ago and there hasn't been one since. That's a long period of absence. Uh, in that intervening time period, the ASEAN GDP has trebled um, up to pushing $2 trillion right now. Uh, 15 years ago, there was one FTA with one ASEAN nation, which was with Singapore. And today there is one FTA with one ASEAN nation, which is still Singapore. Uh, we have all this talk about um, a U.S. ASEAN FTA, and then we say we can't do that because we have different stages of development and we have the issues with Myanmar um, and things like that. And yet the fact is we only have one FTA with one ASEAN nation, which is Singapore. And there's nothing to stop us from doing two, three, four, and it need not even be for ASEAN or even a portion of ASEAN. It could simply be with an ASEAN country. I think we've heard from ambassadors uh, to the United States from the ASEAN nations. They enthusiastically want U.S. participation. You heard the comment earlier, and I'll repeat it, that China has gone from non-existent in Asia, in ASEAN rather, 15 years ago to today the largest trading partner by a margin. Uh, we are simply losing position, and we lose position I believe, uh, speaking as one commissioner, uh, through inattention and neglect. And we need to raise the priority and understand and recognize that this is a critically important nation, a group of nations. It's, after all, it's a little less than 10 percent of the world's population, um, a lesser percentage of the world's GDP, uh, clearly growing, clearly prospering, clearly an important anchor in the Asian theater. And it needs our attention. And I think the commission's report is its, it's bottom line and strongly uh, held conclusion is we need to do a lot more, and what's happened in the past is not at the standard that we need to expect in the future. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioners. Let me now open the floor to uh, comments and questions that you might have. I'll start with the gentleman here in the blue shirt. Uh, could you please identify yourself? Sure. David Lynch with uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, David Lynch with Bloomberg News. Uh, I'd be interested, apart from the inattention and neglect comment Mr. David made, uh, what 
how the panelists explain the fact that we find ourselves in this position today. How did this come about? And second, with the administration talking about a pivot back to Asia, uh, what are your expectations for the president's upcoming trip to uh, APEC and the East Asia Summit? Well, you have to understand that um, um, the U.S. business was the largest uh, in, 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 South, in, in the ASEAN countries for many years. When China opened up, there was a divergence at that point. American companies began to invest in China uh, because of the new opportunities. Huge country. Uh, that's no excuse, obviously, long term for us to neglect the ASEAN region. And so I do think that uh, paying more attention to it and bringing it to the fore uh, will be somewhat helpful. Uh, we're still, if you add the investment we have in China and India together, uh, it's still less uh, than the American investment in the ASEAN countries. But the ASEAN countries are growing, as has been pointed out, and there's need for far more attention by U.S. companies to the ASEAN region uh, than has taken place in the last number of years. So that is critical. Uh, the, uh, as far as the President's visit, well, we've urged that there be a trade mission that the President takes uh, to the region. There's nothing be more important to the ASEAN leaders to see that <clears throat> how serious we are about trade by having CEOs of major companies on the mission. That would, that, would, uh, that would get attention. It happened before, I think, as was pointed out, about 15 years ago, there was a mission uh, taken by the president uh, with business leaders, and it had a profound effect. And so I do think that uh, that's at least one thing we can do. Uh, but there is, there is attention now being paid to the region, and I think that will have positive effects. I can add just a couple of comments about that. Um, part of the neglect has come about that we have been focused on two countries, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, for the past more than 10 years. And so with the focus on what we've been doing there, I think that accounts for some of the uh, neglect in terms of from a policy point of view uh, that uh, the administrations have been consumed uh, uh, with those two countries. Uh, secondly, there has been an, uh, a great deal of activity on the part of the business community to make sure that they got in the front door in dealing with China 15 years ago. Uh, and so the focus was on building uh, opportunity in the Chinese economy, which has been largely uh, achieved, uh, at least uh, to the satisfaction of the Chinese, which are now uh, taking measures to at least uh, uh, reduce some of that, uh, that attractiveness. But uh, I, that's another reason why there's been a shift in focus, saying there's a, there are other big players uh, in the Pacific, and uh, we haven't paid enough attention to them, and that combined, uh, they uh, are uh, bigger than our investment in either our trade, either with China or India, combined. So there's a, 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 both a need uh, and a desire on the part of the administration, and, and should be on the part of the Congress and the American people, to refocus and, uh, quote, rebalance. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Chris Nelson here in the front row. Uh, thanks very much, Ernie. Great study. And thank you guys so much for doing a combination trade and Paul Mill. Uh, bless you. Usually those things get separated and it's entirely different communities discussing them and you wonder, do we live in the same universe? So thank you for putting it in the same universe. Um, uh, it's how I made a living, thank God. Uh, I, uh, sort of a two-parter, if, you, if you'll indulge me. Um, the first one is, how do you see the TPP situation fitting into this notion of an ASEAN FTA? Uh, uh, can you fold it in? Is it a subsidiary or uh, is it going to make it not so necessary? Uh, first question. <coughs> Second uh, part, uh, and this is uh, partly for Secretary Cohen. Uh, you saw last week our, our good friend Clyde Prestwitz had a, an op-ed uh, basically saying, hey, uh, yeah, let the Asians defend themselves. We got business here at home. Let's." Uh, Let's bring everything back and focus on what we need to do here. I'm going to take a wild guess that you probably don't think that's a good idea. But uh, uh, how, how do you discuss in the report, what do you see as the continued role of a forward American presence? How strong uh, should that be? How important is that as part of what you're talking about, reassuring 
uh, assuring the Asians that we're serious, we are going to be here. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Let me ask uh, Carla to handle the first one, if she would, and, uh, and Secretary Cohen obviously should take the second. Well, the President talks about creating jobs, and uh, our private sector is over-leveraged. Our government is over-leveraged. We have 5% of the world's population, and we create roughly 20% of its goods. Now, we need markets. And I think your first question was, in effect, how do we do the TPP and move forward on ASEAN? Well, I say we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We finished the Uruguay round and negotiated the NAFTA, and both were very beneficial to U.S. business, U.S. workers, and U.S. economy. And you, we have to have an outgoing philosophy today if we're going to raise our economic performance. When we say that uh, we were number one in ASEAN a decade ago, and now we're number four, we're losing position notwithstanding our investment in ASEAN out is, is larger than our investment in China and India combined. That no longer holds. The totals don't matter. We've got to look at our relative position in the world and our very great need at home. And our need at home is to create economic act activity for our people. And trade and opening markets is one way to do it. We can have the best businesses, small and large, in the world. But if their products sell for 10, 20, or 30 percent more than our competition, we don't sell as many products. And we see that. We're losing market share because trade agreements are proliferating by others, but not by the United States. I was curious about uh, the suggestion this time for the Asians to take care of Asia. Uh, that is a position that was taken by the Chinese about 15, 12 years ago. In fact, I went over to lecture to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, all their young military officers coming up, when there were a lot of white papers being produced by the Chinese saying, time for the United States to get out of the Asia-Pacific region, time for the Asians to take care of Asia. And I pointed out to them at that time, and I pointed out again today, that would be the worst possible thing for the Chinese and for us. Because if we were to leave, so to speak, or ignore or remain indifferent uh, to the Asia Pacific region, not only ASEAN, but Japan and China and also uh, India, if we were to uh, come back home and take care of America in that sense, then uh, there's a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. Who fills the vacuum? Chinese going to fill it? Are they going to fill it without some contest or concern by the Japanese? Are the Indians going to sit on the sideline? You would have substantial instability in that region, and with instability comes loss of prosperity. Because we like to say that capital is a coward. It takes flight whenever there's instability. So if you want to let Asia take, Asians take care of Asia, you would see a great deal of instability in a region uh, where you're going to see the most prosperity, and you would see uh, a general decline in that. Come back to the uh, United States. Uh, the fundamental pr uh, principle is you cannot have a strong, secure uh, country without a strong and secure economy. Our economy is in trouble. So yes, there's pressure to say, let's focus on, on the United States. Let's let everybody else take care of themselves, and we'll just rebuild. We'll have some nation building here at home. The problem is you can't have security without a strong economy, but you can't have a strong economy without having a strong trade policy or engagement policy. And so the two are linked together inextricably. And we have to make that uh, public policy uh, uh, very clear to the American people. Uh, we have to have a trade policy and engage actively uh, in trading and selling our products and selling our services and selling our intellectual property uh, to other countries. Otherwise, we'll continue to be on a very a steep downward uh, slide. Thank you very much. I think uh, 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 Tom Reckford, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Reckford with the World Affairs Council and the Malaysia America Society. Uh, I'm so glad, Secretary Cohen, that you mentioned our, our military ties and the humanitarian aid. 
because we've done so much over the years that the publics in the ASEAN countries don't know about on the military side uh, with joint training, on the intelligence side, which of course has to be kept secret. But I, I wonder if you could expand on the humanitarian side, because I, I remember how grateful the Indonesians were when we came through with aid after the tsunami that no other country could do. And a lot of Indonesians thought, oh, once the Americans come to Aceh, they'll never leave. And when, they, when we left, uh, they realized that we were really just there to help them. How can we uh, leverage our abilities in the humanitarian area even more than we have uh, up to now? Basically, just point out the successes. I mean, think about it domestically. What happened during Katrina? Uh, what happened during Katrina is we saw uh, some hesitancy uh, during the first uh, day or two uh, when that struck us. It was not until the military became actively engaged and started to organize uh, the effort, the humanitarian rescue effort, suddenly things started to happen. And I think that is true uh, wherever um, uh, we go or wherever we partner up with other countries. When we are able to train with the Indian Navy or the Malaysian Navy or the Singaporean Navy or name the country, whenever we can train together and prepare for these kinds of contingencies, uh, then people will see the benefit of having a strong mill-to-mill -mill relationship. It doesn't have to translate into planes on the ground or tanks on the ground, but rather saying, here are these superiorly superior uh, uh, trained officers and, uh, and enlisted people who are dedicated to protecting one's security. Well, when we protect our security, we protect it against uh, adverse uh, forces, enemy forces. Mother Nature can turn into an enemy. Uh, and we see that. What's a weapon of mass destruction? We've seen weapons of mass destruction, but Mother Nature has her weapons of mass destruction. So by training for these, uh, they are one and the same. You need the same kind of consequence management for Katrina that you need for a military uh, operation. How do you get water? How do you get um, uh, recovery into an area? How do you get medicines? How do you get transportation? How do you set up relief for people? That's all part of military training. It all goes into humanitarian rescue missions. So I think the more the people can see this, uh, they'll be more inclined to support it. Uh, in the second to last row, the, my colleague from CSIS. I'm, uh, I'm Larry Nix from uh, CSIS. Let me address this question to Secretary Cohen because I know... You're speaking to a trustee now, so be careful. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know as, as Secretary of Defense, uh, I believe you dealt with either the issue directly or a similar issue in the late 1990s. The South China Sea has been a source of increased tensions in the last two years and has drawn more U.S. attention. Uh, statements and speeches by Secretary Clinton, for example. Recently, Senator Webb has called on the State Department to study and to issue a clarification of the relationship between the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty and the disputed area in the Spratly chain disputed between China and the Philippines. Now, when I read, and actually I first read it in Chris Nelson's report, that Secretary Webb had done this, the first thing I thought about was Dean Acheson's controversial speech in January 1950, defining yeah. the U.S. defense perimeter in the Western Pacific, leaving out South Korea from that defense perimeter. Do you think there is a need now or in the near future for this kind of clarification of the relationship between the defense treaty and these disputed islands? Or are arguments for ambivalence no, ambiguity. Uh, perhaps, uh, ambiguity. Perhaps, uh, perhaps better, at least at this time. Well, you're right. I did have to confront this issue uh, back in the late 90s, and uh, I uh, came down on the side of keeping it uh, 
um, deliberately ambiguous that once uh, drawing a line, uh, you then have to uh, um, stand behind that line. Interesting uh, question because I watched a debate that took place in July up in Toronto between uh, Dr. Kissinger, who was linked up with Fareed Zakaria, uh, and they were on one side debating uh, against uh, Neil Ferguson and David Lee uh, from Tsinghua University on the other. Uh, I raised a question from the audience, and I asked uh, Fareed Zakaria, because in his book he said, you know, we have to draw some lines with China, uh, but you can't draw them everywhere. So I said, is this one of the lines in the South China Sea that should be drawn? This obviously provoked something of an energetic response from Dr. Kissinger in terms of drawing lines, uh, but essentially, uh, the Chinese position was, as articulated by David Lee, I said, uh, before you start drawing any lines, you better get your financial house in order, uh, which in essence uh, raised another issue in terms of what the Chinese feel about the United States now and how that all plays into the geopolitical stratagems that they're following. And that namely there is some sentiment that perhaps the United States is not as strong uh, as it once was or will be in the future, and China will be stronger, and therefore we're not in a position to be drawing lines uh, or uh, indicating what we will do in response to any kind of provocation. I think what we have to do uh, is to maintain a very um, substantial presence as such. It doesn't mean on the ground uh, presence, but in terms of um, having a presence throughout the Asia Pacific region, having relationships with all of the ASEAN countries, uh, having it with, with Australia, with Japan, with uh, India, and with China, by the way, to make sure that we send the right kind of signal, that we understand that China is going to continue to grow in military power. They're going to continue to challenge uh, the United States and others in terms of that uh, military power, in terms of what their jurisdictional claims are but they must do so in a way that's consistent with international norms. And by reinforcing these relationships, be it the Philippines, with, with, uh, with Vietnam, uh, with Malaysia, with Indonesia, with Singapore, et cetera, we are uh, in essence saying there is a way to resolve these issues without resorting to force or without the United States declaring this is a red line, you cross it, and then what? We have war or conflict. No, there's a better way to handle this diplomatically by, uh, by also showing that we are engaged, we're there, uh, we intend to remain powerful militarily, but we intend to pursue diplomatic resolutions of these kinds of disputes <coughs> rather than drawing uh, red lines. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question is to uh, uh, Secretary Cohen. Uh, we know President Obama uh, visit to Oh, I'm Ching Yi Chen with uh, Phoenix TV, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and we know uh, President Obama's trip to Asia when he, he might announce some uh, the uh, the more military presence in Australia when he visits Australia. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. He might announce uh, there will be more U.S. military presence in Australia. Mm -hmm. And also, he might touch the issue of South China Sea when he meets uh, with the ASEAN uh, leaders. So. Do you think this might cause more friction with Chinese military? It might, um, but that's something that we should um, um, expect, anticipate, to say, look, what's important to us is that the South China Sea not be declared the exclusive zone of any one country, that it be free and open, there be no denial of access uh, for any country in those waters, and that for China to declare that it's all theirs, and that they, um, and for the United States to stay out of any consideration, diplomatic or otherwise, I think is, um, it's really unrealistic on China's part. Uh, so I think we have to, uh, uh, I think Secretary Clinton has laid it out uh, very clearly. I'm sure that that was cleared with uh, President Obama, who that's his policy that she's articulating, uh, that we intend to have stronger relations with the Australians. They've been with us. Uh, at every major conflict uh, that we've had. Uh, they will continue to be with us, and so we're going to reinforce that relationship. But I'd like to see Australia have a stronger relationship with China. I think that's in our interest. I think it's in the interest of ASEAN to continue to have more uh, trade uh, with China. And the message from me, or India having better relations with China, and Japan having, I was just in Japan urging more, 
closer relations with China. I think that's the message you want to send. That we don't, no one's trying to contain China. It cannot be contained. But what we can do is promote uh, a peaceful ex uh, relationship all the way around. And so that's the goal. And for us to have a strong relationship with Australia, that's good. I want more facilities there. Uh, the same with the ASEAN countries, not to have facilities, but to have training. I would invite the Chinese to participate in multilateral um, uh, training operations, rescue missions, humanity. I have advocated that when I was Secretary of Defense. I said, let's have some tabletop exercises. Let's talk about how we could have humanitarian types of missions. There hasn't been a lot of receptivity to that, but I think that's important for the future. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Jim. I'm a reporter from The Straits Times. Um, I was wondering if the panel could talk a little about what you hope um, the ASEAN countries would be able to do more of in this relationship. I mean, you know, is it just more than just giving the U.S. a, a good welcome, you know, economically or, or in the security realm? Uh, what more can they do? Thank you. Ozzie can do a lot. First, we'd like more of their students to come here. We'd like them to invite our people there. Uh, they could do a lot to break down the trade barriers among themselves so that when we sell to one of the countries, we can, or, or invest in one of the countries, we can sell to the other countries. So they, they have a lot to get their act together. And I think as we encourage them to do so, they will. I think that uh, some of the regulations are different for different industries in the various ASEAN countries. And some uh, regulations are quite restrictive on the uh, how much of equity uh, a company can have in a particular ASEAN country. Uh, those things are very uh, negative in trying to build more trade uh, and investment uh, with ASEAN. Uh, some of these changes, some of these issues go back many years, and, and I think it'd be very useful if some of those are revisited, uh, which would be very encouraging to many different industries in the United States. Uh, let me add uh, just a couple of words here. Uh, what uh, I would hope that would come out of the ASEAN countries is a willingness on their part to measure up to their responsibilities in this type of relationship. So if they, frankly, want to continue to do more trade with China, and that's, it, that's uh, understandable, um, they also don't want to be totally dominated by China, which is also understandable. So the United States has a key role to play in this relationship. But I would expect that they have to be willing to do more as well, and not say we'd like to see more of you, but not in our, uh, in our backyard, so to speak. Uh, we'd like to see more exercises take place, but do it with some other country. So I think it's time for the ASEAN countries to measure up to their responsibilities by saying we need to have more training, we need to have more engagement, both in a military, non-military level, uh, on humanitarian missions, et cetera, and students and lots of activities, and don't back away from it, uh, thinking that it somehow is going to upset their trade relationship. They have to be willing to be, um, to be um, upfront enough with the Chinese to say, we want good relations with you, but we also want to do these things which are important to us. So I would, that's what I would expect, a, a bit of, uh, quite a bit of reciprocity. service officer and worked at USTR for a short time in the Southeast Asia Affairs Office. Um, you know, in Washington, many a good idea dies an untimely death. Uh, what do you think the main impediments are to realizing some of these recommendations in the report? A one-word answer? Ignorance. I think very few Americans <coughs> know much about geography beyond our shores, but are particularly uninformed with respect to Asia writ large and ASEAN in particular. So the educational effort of why we care about ASEAN and the exchange with the ASEAN 10 is very important. And so, you know, we urge our trading partners to be transparent. Well, we need to have a lot more transparency on the information with respect to this very important economic block 
that is growing very, very rapidly. And, and let me say an answer to, uh, I want to underscore something that both Rod and Hank said on what can the ASEANs do. The trade barriers among the ASEAN members are extraordinarily high. And if you are going to invest in Malaysia and think you can export with facility to Indonesia, wrong. So if they carry the responsibility of, of increasing the har harmonization among the ASEAN 10 as we move forward to reach out and have an effort to lower trade barriers between the United States and the members of ASEAN, we could have really a magical kind of an economic effect globally, regionally, and, and bilaterally. This is Executive for National Security. Uh, my sense is that uh, uh, many of these countries, India, the ASEAN countries, they don't trust us. And uh, uh, in the case of India, uh, they're concerned that uh, at any moment we won't supply them with uh, spare parts and things because of it. Uh, in terms of uh, military to military, it just took one senator from Vermont to kill the IMET program with Indonesia for a decade. And uh, 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 eventually we came to our senses and uh, realized that uh, because there were some bad apples in the Indonesian uh, army, uh, you know, there really are some in our own. Uh, but we continued to pass defense bills. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, Myanmar, which most many people continue to speak, call the colonial name Burma, uh, you know, we have had, in my view, uh, absolutely uh, insane love affair with uh, the late with Aung San Suu Kyi, and uh, uh, these sanctions are kind of productive and so forth. So, I mean, I, when, when I'm over there and I spend about three months of each year there, they, they, they would love to send all of their kids over to different schools. They can't. At least in some of these places, they can't. And uh, having military to military relations, many places, uh, we won't do it. So what do we do? Well, the whole, the whole idea of this commission and with the U.S. government is to bring about change. This is not an exercise in just seeing, doing nothing. The, uh, there is a, a major movement to, by our government and our administration um, and the business community uh, and even the military uh, to change that that image that you've just portrayed. Uh, Secretary Panetta was just in Asia and made a very important speech. Uh, Secretary um, Hillary Clinton has made several speeches um, on the importance of ASEAN and the United States. Uh, there is a great movement to change the status quo or the backward looking that we had before. And uh, the American business community certainly is interested all it needs is a little encouragement from the administration. If there, was, if there would be a trade mission, it would, it would go a long ways. And uh, those kinds of things uh, will bring about change. The ASEANs want it, and we want it, so there's nothing to stop us from happening except execution. And I, I would hope that the administration will follow through because they've been very public about it. And uh, I, I believe that will happen. I'm confident in it. Okay. Can I add a word about India, because uh, India, after all, the United States has made quite an effort during the past 10 years, starting with President Clinton, having made the first visit uh, to India in the year 2000, followed up substantially by President Bush 43 uh, to extend and expand that relationship. And it was the United States who did all of the heavy lifting, carried all the heavy water, so to speak, on the civil nuclear agreement and to get that passed over strong objection coming not only within the United States, but outside the United States and within India. 
and yet the first thing that happened, the regulations were written in a way that no U.S. company could participate in uh, the nuclear industry in, uh, in India. When we it came time to they needed a new multi-role combat aircraft, uh, the United States offered to sell its two premier combat aircraft, F-18, F-16. Both were declared to be insufficient or not meeting their, their requirements. The two most capable aircraft in the world, combat aircraft, uh, were rejected because it didn't comply, uh, it didn't meet their standards. Something was wrong with that picture. So it's not always the United States who's not a reliable supplier. We not necessarily have a reliable consumer. Uh, under certain circumstances. So it's a reciprocity becomes a key element here. I think that the relationship's getting better. There's more trust being uh, developed, hopefully. But that comes on both sides of the equation. And so I would hope that uh, they would see the benefit of having a better relationship with the United States. When you see a report that comes out on the paper uh, that uh, military officials uh, in, uh, in uh, India are worried about the expansion of Chinese power. Well, okay, uh, there are some ways in which you can contend uh, and, uh, and deal with that. But you can't have it both ways, blame the United States for not being a reliable supplier and then come up with rationales why the U.S. can't participate in these major activities. Okay, we're at time. Let me ask the commission uh, if they have any, if anyone would like a final word before we close. If not, I hope you'll join me in thanking the commission for its work and I thank you for joining us today. Thank you.